Hello and welcome. I am Allison, and I'm talking about creating community platforms with Django. Um, in the course of this conversation, my hope is that different people in this uh, conversation are able to walk away with different things. That anyone who's interested in creating an online community platform is equipped with an understanding of the different elements that would make that a strong community platform and different online tools that can reinforce those elements. I'm hoping that junior developers are walking away feeling equipped and empowered to start using uh, external and open source packages, and that people who are here who um, are the, the kind of people who love junior developers, be that mentors or teachers, uh, managers, are walking away with a better understanding of where maybe some of the, the opportunities for learning are for especially those of us who are coming out of the, the code school experience. Um, as it relates to external packages. And I am particularly well equipped to give this talk. I am myself a junior developer. I just graduated in June from PDX Code Guild, which is a full stack web development program um, that focused on, on the front end, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and on the back end, Python and Django. Um, the project that I started working on after I graduated was what I'm calling a little black book for hustlers. It's this idea that uh, people who are in business development, people who are in marketing, people whose careers really rely on having a strong network and knowing who to go to when they need an amazing web developer or a fantastic graphic designer or even a fabulous haircut, that that gives them the edge in their work. That part of how they maintain that network and those connections is by swapping that information about, okay, check out this graphic designer, check out this web designer. Um, and in doing so, they reinforce their, their network and, and get that competitive edge. Um, this was inspired by a friend of mine who is himself in business development. And as I started building out that project, I, um, I might be a little bit biased. I might be inclined to build community into everything I create, because I really like community. Um, but I saw an opportunity for community since um, this is a space where people are coming together and they're sharing this information to reinforce their connections. Um, there was an opportunity to build in a news feed, to build in a messaging system. And so I started looking to external packages as a way to build those pieces in. In addition to my work as a junior developer, I also am a community manager. I launched a community in 2012 and have grown it to 1,500 members. Um, we have online and in-person events, a vibrant online discussion community, and events that run from 15 people to 75 people. So thriving community there, and a ton of learning that came out of that experience. So I'm a community manager. I recently graduated from a boot camp, and just recently, I got hired. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, thank you. I started New Relic on Monday, and I am super, super excited to be uh, joining that company. Um, and really excited to be celebrating that by talking to you all at a Python conference. Um, so this is a talk that really pulls from my passions. I am passionate about the power of community to impact people and their development. I am passionate about Python. I think it's an amazing language. Um, it's intuitive, it's straightforward, it's powerful. And I am passionate about the idea that as developers, we can learn through coding and there's so much value to just getting into the code and figuring it out. But we can also learn through conferences, through blogs, from one another's mistakes so that we don't have to um, beat our heads against exactly the same wall that somebody else has already figured out. And over the course of this conversation, I'm going to start by talking about designing a community platform and then go to talking about how to assess packages and implement packages to build that community platform. And then look at a few specific platforms that might be relevant to your interests as you're building out a community platform in Django. As I talk about community, I'm pulling from um, a couple of different places. I'm pulling from my experience, certainly, as a community manager. I'm pulling from Douglas Atkin, who's the global head of community for Airbnb, and he worked in community at meetups before that. 
He wrote a blog called The Blue Project, which I highly, highly, highly recommend. If you're interested in learning more about how to develop community, what elements make up a community, it's an amazing resource. What was it called? The Blue Project, and I'll have it in a slide at the end as well. Um, I also pull from Peter Kollek. He was a sociologist at UCLA who was focused on building online communities in the late 90s, so did some really early academic work on this topic. So pulling their two sets of ideas around what makes community together. I believe that there are six elements that are present in every community. And this spans from long-term, complicated communities like an activist <coughs> group that has a really nuanced perspective on how they're going to change the world and has been working at it for 100 years. And these six elements of community are also present in a moms of two-year-olds group, which just started last Tuesday and only exists as long as their kids are two. Um, and the six elements are a sense of belonging. You need to know, are they like me? And do they like me from the community that you're potentially joining? There needs to be a shared sense of purpose. Um, then that can be complicated or it can be really straightforward. You need opportunities to interact and of the ability to organize. And with that organization, members need to understand how it's being organized. What's the leadership structure? Who's in charge? How are they making the decisions? How can I influence the community that I'm in? You need group boundaries. You need to know who's welcome to make use of the community's resources and who's not. And that's uncomfortable. In all of my experience, I have found that knowing who is and who's not a part of the community is an important part of building thriving communities. But I don't like it, because it goes completely contrary to my um, commitment to diversity and my interest there as well. So that's something that I'm really interested in talking more about. If you, if you catch me in the hallway, I'd love to talk more about how we create communities that have the benefits of ensuring that people who come into the community take from it appropriately and give to it appropriately and are also inclusive. And finally, to have a thriving community, you need a code of conduct and a way to monitor it. And that can be spoken or unspoken. One of the really interesting part of Peter Kollek's work is that he called out that communities that are self-monitored, where the members are the ones who have the opportunity to um, ensure that the code of conduct is being uh, adhered to, are some of the most successful. So these are the six elements of community. And I'm going to talk about different online tools that might help build each of those different elements into a community. But before I, want to, before I talk about that, I want to touch on some perspectives for how to think about which of these tools it might be useful to implement into your online community. So that if you already have a community that you're building a platform for, as you're going through all these options, you can kind of pick and choose. Um, because Picking and choosing tools is really important. When building a successful online community platform, you want to avoid tool, tool overwhelm. You want to create an intuitive way for new members to interact with the community. And there are, for me, two different perspectives that really guide my thinking on this. One is Douglas Atkins' community commitment curve. He put forth the idea that engagement in a community is something that happens over time and on a curve, that if a community member is asked to take an appropriate step towards greater involvement, they're more likely to take the next step towards involvement. Um, so if a new member joins your group and you ask them to fill out their member profile and look at the member profiles of a few other members, they're more likely to take that next step and come to an event because they're going to start to be able to answer that question of, are they like me? Do they like me? But if a member comes to their first event ever, they're nervous, they're just walking up into the room, and I walk up to them and I'm like, hi, I'm Allison. Do you want to leave this event for the next two years? That's going to freak them out. So those appropriate um, commitments, those appropriate asks help people get more involved. And I really found this to be um, true in my experience. Uh, about three years into running the community that I run, we found that we needed some money to actually run the thing, um, fancy that, and started asking for donations. 
And I expected that it would be the members who were actively involved, but not yet contributing particularly. They weren't volunteering yet, they weren't hosting events. It would be those members who would be most likely to donate because they clearly love the community and they're not giving yet, maybe because they don't have the time. So maybe money is an easier way for them to give. I figured the last people to contribute would be my event hosts, the people who are already giving of their time and energy. I figured they had kind of already satisfied what was needed of them. They could take a pass on the, the donations. That was not how it worked at all. It was my event hosts, my volunteers, who were the most generous in supporting our community. And that really speaks to this idea that as people become more involved, they become more involved. So structuring an online platform that gives people the opportunity to contribute appropriately and to take little steps towards deeper involvement um, is gonna set your online community up for a lot of success. <clears throat> the other perspective that I pull from that informs how I think about designing an online community platform actually pulls from game design. And I don't have a good reference on this, so if anybody knows who came up with this idea, let me know, because it was a friend who told me about it. And specifically, he said that as video game development has matured over time, there's been a move away from long tutorial experiences and towards giving gamers the opportunity to figure out from their environment what they should be doing next. If they're accused from the environment, punch that, or accused from the environment, jump over that, um, that's gonna be a more satisfying beginner gamer experience than 30 minutes of explanation and tutorial. This translates to community pretty straightforwardly. You think about going to a party, you walk in the door at a party and somebody's like, whoa, whoa, and they give you 10 minutes of rules on, okay, here's how you're gonna navigate the party and this is what you do. It's probably gonna kill your joy a little bit. Um, but also if you walk into a party and nobody greets you, and it's not clear where the snacks are, where the bathroom is, that's gonna be rough too. So in designing an event, you're looking for those same principles that are present in game design, that it's intuitive to navigate the experience. You know what you're trying to do. And that translates to online, an online platform as well. You want it to be obvious to your members how they navigate the space, which tools to engage in first. Um, so that they're having an intuitive, self-driven, satisfying experience. Thinking about different ways to build these six elements of community into a community platform. A statement of purpose helps potential members decide whether this is the type of community that they're interested, if they're interested in contributing to this type of purpose. Rich member profiles or a member list give members the sense of whether these are my people. Are these the types of people that I want to be connected to? One of the things that I think is so powerful about online community is that it can be such an information rich environment. I host a party, it's not as information rich as an online community platform that can have blogs or resource pages or forums or videos. These are all incredibly valuable tools for helping members understand, to get a deeper understanding of the, the shared purpose, to get real-time updates about new things that are happening, and to really deepen their commitment to that, um, that shared sense of purpose. You wanna give your members an opportunity to interact? And there are so many fantastic ways to do this in an online environment, forums, messaging, friending and following, local groups, event tools. I think there's a really interesting balance between interaction and the code of conduct. So thinking strategically about, do these members already know each other? Is this the first time that they're gonna be interacting? How do we ensure that that interaction is safe in an online environment is, is one of the topics that I'm particularly interested in. In terms of organization, um, we've already talked a little bit about ensuring that your members understand the leadership structure, but rules, member do, dues, activity feeds, mobilization tools, and member categories are all other ways to build in a sense of organization or empower members to get involved in, in organization. 
It's a question of, of group boundaries. Um, is perhaps easier in an online environment. You've got a login and sign up function, so it's kind of baked in. Um, and in terms of the code of conduct, in the, in the looking at good moderation tools is an important part of building safe online communities. And this is one of the things that I'm really interested in is how do we use technologies to make communities safer? So would love to have a deeper conversation about this if that's something that you're interested in as well. I am not a designer. I don't put together most of my outfits and I don't do the interior design on my home. I am not the person to tell you about visuals and branding. So I only want to say that it is important, that it can make the difference between a thriving online community platform and a failed uh, community platform. For example, A Practical Wedding is a wedding website and blog, and they have a thriving commenting section. It's a terrible technological tool. It's glitchy, it's painful to use, but man, do people put time into it. And I think part of the reason is because there's very consistent visuals and branding. Versus Being Boss is an online uh, blog, podcast, and community for makers, designers, um, the self-employed, and um, it's, a, it's a very visually driven community. These are people whose favorite uh, social media tool is Instagram. So when they jumped onto Slack and built their primary product into a Slack community platform, it was a failed attempt, and they've, they've since called that out. Of the people that pay to use that platform, only 50% are engaged. And I think part of that is that there's a disconnect between the very visually driven nature of the Being Boss community and the not as visually driven uh, nature of Slack. So we've talked a little bit about designing an online community platform and the different components that can be involved in that. And in my process, I decided I wanted to build in an online community platform and started looking at what packages I could use to do that. But before I even jumped into packages, there was this question, hand code, use a package, use a lightweight package, use a heavyweight package, I don't know. <laughs> so over the next bit of the, the conversation, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and focus in on Django packages, looking at um, whether or not it makes sense to use a Django package, looking at how to select a Django package, and then looking at some um, best practices or possible bumps in implementing Django packages. In talking to some of my friends and family about what this talk was that I was going to be giving, um, I was trying to explain to them what a Django package even was and how it compared to, to hand coding. And the metaphor that I came up with was that hand coding is kind of like, hand, is like building a piece of furniture from scratch. Going to Home Depot, doing the carpentry, creating it from scratch. Whereas using a package is like going to Ikea. Some of the pieces are already created, um, but there are still instructions and you still have to set the thing up. And as I looked at packages, and then as I looked at different Ikea options or different packages, I found that there were some lightweight options and some heavyweight options. Lightweight packages being a package that really only has one tool, maybe E2, and that fits into a pre-existing project. So maybe like Legos, and a heavyweight package being something that has a lot of tools and is designed to be the next thing that you implement after Django before you do any of your own coding. As I did research on hand coding versus implementing packages, I found that the general consensus was that the benefit to hand coding is that you learn to hand code something. So if you're going to be in a position where you code a newsfeed on a regular basis, or you're really interested in how to code a newsfeed, then sure, hand code it. But if there is a package that already does it, there's a lot of value in using that package. Keeps you from reinventing the wheel. Um, it's probably going to be slower to hand code. And there's a missed opportunity to focus on customizing. Since it will potentially take you longer to hand code it, there's less opportunities to uh, focus on really making the project the right fit for you. There was a lot of talk about the idea that packages were a pretty typical tool to be using as a developer, and a lot of talk about the idea that hand coding helped to learn to, hand, to, learn to code something. But what nobody called out, and what certainly was my experience, 
is that using a package is its own challenge and potentially has its, the, its own skill set associated with it. And so I think there's some value in, I don't think the educational value of implementing packages should be dismissed because I think there is value in learning to implement packages because um, it's its own challenge. Lightweight packages are more customizable and they fit into an existing project. Um, there is a potential for conflict between multiple packages. And there's generally worse documentation and community support, which I would not have guessed. It doesn't necessarily seem like common sense, but it ends up making a lot of sense. This idea that if a developer develops a tool and enjoys it, so they develop another tool and enjoy that, and so they develop another tool, over time they have a heavyweight package. So you're likely to have uh, more established packages being the heavier weight ones. So as a rule of thumb, generally better documentation. And similarly, if the, the heavyweight package has a bunch of different tools, there's a bunch of different reasons that somebody might come to using that tool. So there's likely to be a larger community support, which is really important, which is really valuable in those bugs. So heavyweight packages, faster, more robust, and generally better documentation and community support, but less flexible. I may have to code that uh, little black book again from scratch to use uh, the right heavyweight package for it. One of the really great resources in using Django packages is the Django package website. It compares different Django packages. It brings together information about a ton of different Django packages, organizes them based on their function, um, and then does some comparison work of the different packages. It's a really, really valuable resource. Also, possibly a little overwhelming, there were 30 options for how to build social in using Django packages. Um, so my first question as I started to try to implement them was, how do I even pick from all of these options? And speaking to this, this question of what's the experience of junior developers, my lack of experience was a problem at this point because some of, these some of these questions are super straightforward. Does documentation exist? Really straightforward question. But as a junior developer without much experience, I came across a package that didn't have any documentation and I couldn't decide, is this a red flag? It feels like a red flag that maybe I shouldn't use this package or is this normal and a more experienced developer would tell me to buck up, fortify, and try to implement the code? Um, so uh, as it turns out, many packages do have documentation and it's a pretty good sign uh, for whether or not you might want to use uh, the, the package. Does it include sensible and clear instructions? And then these next three questions, is it stable? How many people are using it? And is there a community supporting it? are all questions that the Django Packages website answers. Um, and last but not least, does anyone you know recommend it? This will save you all kinds of pain and anguish if you know somebody who's already using it and can answer your questions. And so my hope is that with these five questions, you can open up the Django Packages website, look at your 30 options, and in just a few minutes, assess, is this right, is this not right, is this gonna work for me, and narrow it down to a reasonable number of packages to try to implement and work with. And so I did, I took my 30 options for how to build community into a Django uh, platform and I narrowed it down to four packages, Pinax and Wagtail on the heavyweight side and Django Stream and Stream Framework on the lighter weight side. I found a lot to like about Pinax. There's a lot of different tools that can come with it and the opportunity to, to customize which ones you're going to install and not. Um, so that sidesteps some of the challenges that might be present in a heavyweight package because at the beginning of your installation project, you can choose the, um, the starter project and then all the other pieces that you're going to add in. And there's a bunch of tools, newsfeed, messaging forums. Pinnix is also designed with a focus on community, so more of the tools are useful in a community setting. The documentation's kind of a work in progress. Some of the, the Pinnax packages have great documentation, others have no documentation at all. Uh, but there is a Slack channel where you can go to ask questions and it's being updated regularly, so hopefully over time, 
it will get better and maybe we can support it getting better as we uh, start to use it. Wagtail is a more classic CMS. It wasn't particularly well designed for the community function that I needed. Um, but if what you're looking for is a, is a CMS, it might be a good option, especially because it does have good documentation and really strong community support. It was probably um, the most straightforward installation. Django Stream had my favorite documentation. Um, I think through this project I've, dis I've discovered I have really strong opinions about documentation. <laughs> um, one of the things that I loved about the Django Stream package is that in addition to the documentation itself, it also had a starter project. So you had both the code and a tutorial step-by-step -step instructions for how to implement that particular code, which was really helpful in getting it up and running and also understanding how it was supposed to work. Drawback, it's just a news feed. That's all it does. It's a nice news feed, but <laughs> uh, stream framework I struggled with. The documentation, from my, from my experience, made assumptions that I wasn't able to also make with it. So I really struggled to implement it. If you've had success with it, or if you later have sex with, success with it, let me know. I'd love to have that conversation. I want to know what I was missing with <laughs> that one. Okay, so we've talked about what to include in a community platform, how to narrow down the Django packages that you could use to build a community platform, which ones might be a good option to install. And as you're listening to me talk about the pros and cons of these different packages, what you're not hearing me say is, this was absolutely perfect, all communities should use it, and it was a snap to install. So. I want to talk about some of the bumps that might come up in the process of installing uh, a package. A little bit of how to navigate them so that hopefully it's a smoother process for you as you jump into to using Django packages. One of the things that, that served me was um, relying on the coding best practices that I've already developed through hand coding. A lot of that ended up translating, which was good. Um, using what I have in terms of if there was some documentation, using that to try to intuit what might come from it. Um, searching iteratively, searching for the search terms that maybe make sense, skimming the article, finding some more search terms that maybe make more sense, searching again, doing that same process over again, maybe three more times, <laughs> but getting that down to the, the keywords that are gonna be helpful. Um, and then taking careful notes Zach made the suggestion that you keep the notes from the commands that work in one file and all of your other notes in another file. And that was a really great suggestion because what that meant was that I walked out of it with some clear instructions for what to do next time, which, which hopefully I can then run through and do again successfully and maybe even make a contribution to the open source, the documentation of the open source projects themselves. Came across a lot of import errors. A lot of import errors. Which makes sense. As I'm, as I'm building out my projects, I occasionally uh, install something that I don't remember that I've installed by the time I'm writing my documentation. Um, so somebody else trying to implement my project might, might encounter import errors in my projects. Um, but they, they did come up quite a bit and the solution I mean, this isn't terribly helpful, but figure out what the dependency is and install it. Um, so perhaps more, uh, perhaps more helpful. Often the import error would indicate what the dependency was. Sometimes that was helpful, sometimes that was not. Because sometimes the dependency had a really unique name that was easily searched for and I could figure out how to, uh, how to install. And sometimes it had a really common sounding name which could account. How many dependencies are named, okay, not helpful. Um, so sometimes the import errors were helpful, sometimes they weren't. Uh, the requirements TXT document is really helpful when it exists, and for a lot of the Pinax packages it doesn't. So uh, finding an impl implemented project with a working requirements TXT and stealing their good work to set up your uh, environment so that you can properly install the package. So in summary, um, I would encourage you to design community platforms that are intuitive to navigate, intu include tools that move members up the commitment curve and satisfy each of the six elements of community. 
I would encourage using heavyweight packages with good documentation and large community support if you are a new developer focused on getting a project up and running as quickly as possible. Um, and I would warn that implementing packages is not always straightforward, but that coding best practices and keeping an eye on undocumented de dependencies helps. <laughs> so.